Hello and welcome to the National Michael Chekhov Association's Characterization the NMCA Way on your feet and insights. I am Lisa Dalton, one of the co-founders of the organization and I am here with my colleague. Here, I'm Will Kilroy and I'm a co-founder and the vice president of the National Michael Chekhov Association and we're so glad you've joined us for characterization and I'm gonna jump right in to give you a little something to try. So what I'd like you to do while you're sitting or standing there is in your head, see if you can solve this basic algebraic equation for me, which is X times Y minus seven equals 767 plus two. So mull that over and see if you can give me what the X and the Y would be. So X and the Y are multiplied minus seven and it equals 767 plus two. So just in your head, so you don't want to write it out, but you're just trying to see if you can solve that for me. And then be aware of the energy in your body. Where is that energy now focused? Where is it going? Who do you determine that energy to be? And forget it, we don't need to know that answer. Let it go, let it go, let it go. All right, now what I'd like you to do is to bring into yourself an awareness of something that you love. It could be a person, it could be nature, it could be a pet, something that you love, you really love, and start to imagine all of the attributes of that person, place, pet, whatever it is. So just bringing to yourself all of the attributes. And as you're in that love space, being aware of your energy. Where does your energy tend to focus as you bring in this image of this item or person that you love? Where is your energy focused now? Just be aware of it. Let your imagination be free. And you can let that go. Have that for later. All right, now what I'd like you to do is to imagine a need that you have. You need to accomplish something. So don't leave us. But what if you did? What if you got up right now? What would it be that you would do? There's something you need to accomplish. You need to get it done. Maybe we even look around and, and see something in your environment that you need to clean or change or move. And when you're feeling that need, where does the energy in your body go? Where does it end up? So just bringing that need in, imagining you're gonna get up and go do it. You can get up for a moment and, and stay within camera range. But uh, just experiencing that need, and where is your energy now? Where is that energy? And you don't really need to do that right now. So let that go. And we're going to move right on to Jeffrey. Hey, everybody. So Will took us through all three of those different forces. We're going to focus in this activity on one of them, the thinking forces. When we think about the thinking forces, they're right here in the head. And so we're gonna take a character that really uses that as their motivation, their drive. Uh, everybody take a second to connect to your ideal artistic center. Look up into that image sphere way above and grab the character of the Tin Woodsman from The Wizard of Oz. Beam that Tin Woodsman down into your body. Now, the Tin Woodsman has no heart, so he relies on his thinking forces. What I want you to do is I want you to imagine your full body is the Tin Woodsman, and you are rusted. So get into some kind of position where you would be rusted solid. What we're going to do is slowly but surely, we're going to begin to move as if we were oiled parts of our body. Start with your feet and let's get those feet oiled and start moving them. It's probably a mechanical back and forth feeling. Move that up your legs and into your hips and oil those arms right at the joints so you can feel those arms being able to move and go to the neck move that neck around finally we can move and begin to explore the space around you 
moving in this kind of mechanical or robotic way. What's one action that you could probably do, like pick up a book or uh, write something down? Continue exploring this space with these mechanical movements and see how that affects your breath. Are you moving on the floor in a linear fashion or diagonals? Let's bring that back now uh, and bring yourself back to your camera and let's go ahead and release that feeling of thinking force and robot and, and tin woodsman and let that fly back up into that sphere of images, shake it off and I'm gonna pass it over to Paul. Great, I am going to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Can all see this? Yes. I am going to stay with the thinking life as well. That's what I was thinking about. And I'm going to uh, think about adding a little bit of a quality to it, um, to the thinking life. Obviously, we have the thinking, feeling, willing life, uh, our inner landscape. So I just want you to think about that place where Will was talking about, uh, that place where you were, you were doing that equation in your head and what's going on inside of there. If you would like to, you could use your fingertip, which is also connected to the thinking life. And I want you to just, whatever spiritedly is to you, it don't, it don't get into right or wrong, whatever that quality is to you, you're going to think spiritedly and you're going to say the words, you know, I've been thinking about it and I'm thinking, you know, thinking about this. Whatever that is to you, don't think about it, just let it go. Just thinking spiritedly and just say those words, everybody at the same time. You know? I've been thinking about it. I'm thinking that you're not thinking right about this. I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking that you're not thinking right about this. Yeah, about it. You're thinking that you're not thinking right about this. Good, good, and just let the, that, that kind of go. We're going to still stay up in that area. Now we're going to think ponderingly, and whatever that ponderingly means to you, that quality means to you, you're thinking, and just it starts to become ponderingly. Hmm. I've been. Thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. thinking about it. I've been thinking about it. And I'm thinking you're not thinking right about this. About it, but I'm thinking you're not thinking right about it. Awesome, awesome. Uh, again, then we're just going to move to the next one, kind of let that wash away. And now we're going to just enter our thinking life, but make it cleverly. Hmm. What is thinking cleverly to you? I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about it. And I've been thinking about it. And I'm thinking that you're not thinking right about this. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. And I'm thinking you're not thinking right about this. I'm thinking that you're not thinking right about this. Awesome. That was awesome. And just kind of let that go. And I'm going to pass it on to Ophir. Let's imagine our brain, our brains, our mind. Just see it. Take a few seconds. You can close your eyes and see your brain. And now the brain starts swirling and swirling and swirling and it becomes like a vortex in inside your head and the vortex has a down motion and just imagine this vortex inside your head and just let it be there and breathe with it and start counting and talk from this sensation. Count till 10. 
One, two, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, seven nine, nine, ten. And let this vortex becomes more wild and faster. See it, imagine it, it's happening, it's a sensation. And now talk from it, talk from it, talk. One, two, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, five, ten. Crazy. One, two, three, four, five, five, what? One, two, three, four, five. And we can let it go and throw it away. And I will pass it to Joanne. Um, so I'm gonna hand it to Brad. One of the things that's the most interesting to try to figure out is the difference between these things, the difference between how these things feel, uh, how they are part of my body. And one of the best ways to embrace this notion of differentiating between them is to visualize it, to visualize it as best you can. And a great way to begin to visualize it is to think about a, an insect crawling on your hand, on your body. And if the insect is here, the feeling, the feeling that you have of it right here is the insect, it's the feeling force. This is the feeling force. And if the insect crawls out onto my finger, where, strangely enough, we don't have as much sensitivity, I still know it's there, but I don't have the same feeling. And as soon as it crawls up onto the tender skin of my arm, that becomes the will force. That becomes the heel of my hand. So the, f the feeling of the insect on my body, it puts it on the external. It, puts, it allows me to visualize the feelings of these different forces, the thinking force, the feeling force, and the willing force, and, and, and visualize how I can incorporate them into my physicality. So I'm gonna focus on the feeling, and what I want you to do is envision a pet or animal in, in, your, that, in your life that you've loved. And while you do that, I want you to make curvy gestures with your body. Now, I want you to think how you feel or how you felt when you lose this pet and the pet is no longer with you. And think about, not don't think, but feel it where it is in your body and how it affects your voice and your feelings and experience whatever it is that you would experience and have that affect your your dialogue and your speech and and just say well i don't know let me think about what i'm going to do today and then make your plans for the day even though you've just lost your favorite pet let me think about what i'm going to do today I don't know. Figure out what to do today. I'm not sure. I'm not doing anything today. I'm not doing anything. I'm not gonna. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know. So take a deep breath and release it. Okay, very lovely. What I'd like you to do now is we're gonna play a little bit with the will force. So I would like you to imagine that you are seated and you might actually be seated but that you have to go to the bathroom. But you can't get up. 
but you want to get up and it's getting urgent. You notice um, your heels, the heels. Uh, what are your heels doing? Uh, what's, what are the heels of your hands doing? What is the bottom of your torso doing? What is your jaw doing? So you've got to try and hold this together. But you have a very urgent urge. Can you feel all those urges? Can you feel where they're living in the body? And, and imagine now that you're wanting to mask that so that no one knows and your line of dialogue and a behavior. So I'd like you to do a behavior where you're attempting to veil or hide it. I'd like you to do a behavior where you pick up a pen or pencil or a beverage and say, would, are you almost finished? Is your line, are you almost finished? Uh, are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? You almost are you finished. Almost, almost finished? Are you, you almost, almost finished? finished? Are you, are you finished? almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you uh, almost finished? Are you, are you almost, almost finished? finished? Good. And and now release it. And just think for a moment. We'll review for a moment some of the key areas. The the will force tends to be on the bottom of things and the jaw in the thumb and the heel of the hand, like we've spoken, uh, the heel of the torso, you could say, the heel of the foot and the limbs and the lower, uh, you know, below the gut uh, down and the limbs. So uh, we tend to work with earthy elements with it and we tend to work with um, the the guttural the sounds they come off the bottom of the jaw g d r j and so let's let's just take this line uh, now and really veil the urge but allow yourself to do the same line and just punch up the <clears throat> the qual the the will driven sound so you can feel the sounds with the same business, same line. Are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you almost, almost are you finished? Almost finished? Are, you are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Are you almost finished? Good. Are you almost finished? Good, and now release that will force and imagine that you were able to accomplish that task of relieving yourself and you're in the feeling force <laughs> and you're going to say the same line. Now you have, you have a great feeling of relief and allow yourself to change. How does that allow the bowels to come forward, allow the movement pattern to shift and shifting into that middle curves, round stuff like that and try that. Are you almost finished? 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 Good, and release that, and let's do the thinking force, and let's add a quality, like um, Paul mentioned. Uh, you could, it could be one of the ones that Paul mentioned. Re remind us of the three that you did, Paul, the qualities of thought. Uh, let me look really quick. Uh, spiritedly, ponderingly, and cleverly. Okay, uh, so you can pick one of those three or another one. Same line. Hmm. Are you? 
almost um, finished. finished. Almost finished. Are you almost finished? Almost. Are you almost finished? Beautiful. Uh, uh, Thank you, everyone, for taking us through our Trinity of Psychology. Check off on your feet. We are all NMCA alumna and alumni, and we have just been improvising and playing with uh, different aspects of thinking, feeling, and willing. Now we will continue our chat and we'll look at some insights and ideas and we'd love to open it up to hear any responses or thoughts about what you brought to the table or what you experienced or ways that you like to use uh, the Trinity of Psychology or questions that you have to further understand it and its potential. This is Beth. So what I'm doing is I'm preparing a recorded audition for a spot, for a commercial spot as a mother. So I was thinking I could draw on the feeling force and that would help me to ground me in that. Beth, I think that's an excellent thing. Uh, that, that mother role was one that I often uh, use the mother archetype and I do feel that the feeling force is when they're looking for that mother That is the predominant force. So I think you're going to be spot-on with that. I think it should be very helpful I just wanted to throw in that for those of us that direct this is an excellent way to delineate characters and having just directed the 25th annual Putnam County spelling bee uh, I use the <laughs> Some was predominantly, you know, one of these kids was a thinking kid and one came from the heart with their little bear that they carried around with them. So they were the feeling character. And then the, you know, archetypal jock character, you know, was more the will force. And so they, they were able to find both leading centers based on that trinity of the psychology and be very different characters. So they weren't just all, oh, we're kids at a spelling bee. They were very well delineated, I think, because of that work. That's the feedback I got from the actors as well, that it really helped them grasp onto something for their characters. Um, yeah, uh, to add on to that, um, I often will, as a director, use archetypes as a, a way to engage the actors in something very universal that the audience can recognize. And when it comes to uh, sometimes those questions actors have of what might not be working in this scene, uh, we it's, it's a little thing uh, to just look at something like, well, um, is there a conflict between this person's will and this person's thinking forces? And often that can tie back to what their archetype is. Uh, and so I find that that is very helpful when we're working with archetypes is to think about each of those different forces and what drives the character. Yeah, hi, I think that also it's, it's, it's also not just the, the, the trinity, but the quality. So the, the, I, I love the spiritually, pon, ponderingly, of thinking, so it's not just thinking for thinking's sake, you know, we, we have these ideas, but all of these qualities have qualities of them. And so I find that working, you know, even doing monologue work, a monologue is, is kind of this journey that sometimes might start in a thought and then go into feeling and then go into back into thought and then into willing. So it's also this way of kind of mapping out a journey for an actor to, to say, wait a minute, there's a, there's a shift there, there's a beat change there, where are you going? And we know that when Michael Chekhov privately coached Mala Powers, there were two questions that he asked her first off. One of those questions was, is your character predominated by thinking, feeling, or willing? And part of that question was, and how does their thinking, feeling, and willing force differ from your own? And so that's where this question of qualities of the different psychological values um, exist. These uh, three forces are part of every human being and it's part of what makes us actually a human. And when we think of it as the trinity of psychology, we're using the word psychology in the same meaning that the source psyche, uh, meaning soul, 
is rather than the psychology of a sort of the Freudian or Jungian kind of identity of that word psychology. We're looking at these forces in the human being that makes us human, that we have free will and that we have an emotional capacity and that we have a thinking capacity. So um, animals have this sort of emotional capacity. We see that in, especially an animal like an elephant, they have high, high levels of emotional capacities. Um, but, the, but the thinking force and the act of absolute free will, these are only human. And so these three forces are vital in all of us and we each have a unique way of working with them, of relating to them. And one of those ways tends to be our primary operating mode and the manner in which we, for example, if I am thinking predominated, I am also, I either tend to be, uh, there's a quality to that my thinking forces tend to have. And so I love what Joanne was saying about mapping out the path of the character or the path of the story. Um, and if it starts thinking and it moves into feeling and moves back into thinking, we can also ask, how is my thinking quality different in this first thinking phase and how is my thinking quality different in this section? Uh, you know, how does the expressivity level of my feeling life shift or my will force shift? And of course, we, we love to use uh, the, the Wizard of Oz as a model for explaining the concepts of the human psychology uh, with the scarecrow and the tin man and the, the lion uh, and we notice they have distinct qualities of thought, feeling and will and this distinct movement pattern. So in a lot of uh, the world of Chekhov, these are relegated, these three forces are just relegated to two centers. They're called a head center, a heart center and a will center. And that can be very useful. However, there's so much more, you know. And so let's talk a little bit more about um, what you experienced just in our playtime or other ways that you have used the, uh, this trinity. Um, any discoveries you've made, examples of people finding something they just wouldn't have found in their character or something like that? Uh, in general. When, I, when I'm trying to, I mean, when, I, when I'm teaching an introductory acting class, that if they, if they ask for something um, to try to, if they want something Chekhov based, which is generally sort of more advanced per se, um, what I would normally choose to do first to just sort of like, you know, pull back the cover on the notion of a, a hint of what Chekhov stuff can tap into I generally use TFW because, because it's the fastest way to begin to show somebody how much they can, they can choose to take, uh, I guess, a sense of the self and begin to compartmentalize it and put pieces of it into pieces of characterization and do things that have to do with still being true to the, to the character, but not doing it just by the seat of the pants, doing it much more much more proactively thinking about it, making choices, making active choices about it, as opposed to letting things just happen and kind of going with the character that that happens to be. I find that a lot of beginning actors think that all acting is essentially just seat of the pants oriented. It's just kind of, just do, wing it, just do it. And, and that TFW is a quick way to be able to explain, no, it's not. It's, it, you, can, you can divide it up lots faster than you think, lots quicker than you think, and much more deeply than you think. And, um, and, and so TFW tends to be the way to begin to show that. I just wanted to say that. I, I also wanted to say how much I love the Tin Man exercise, how 
when I was doing the Tin Man exercise, how I thought about every movement I did. And I didn't move my hand until I, my brain told my hand to move. And it was such a discovery. I was like a little kid. And I was like, this is what, this is how robots feel. <laughs> and I could see, I could see why the Tin Man wanted a heart so badly. It was, it was a love, I was, I was, I was having so much fun. <laughs> really letting my brain take over. It was lovely. Thank you for that exercise. Yeah, so uh, an example that I actually have that, that feels very similar to what um, you guys were just talking about. When I directed a production of The Never Ending Story, we discovered at the beginning that one of the biggest issues that was going on with the main character, the young boy, and his father was that the father, after the passing of his wife and the boy's mother, um, had disconnected in many ways from those feeling forces and tried to stay mostly in his head or mostly in his will. And the son had gone the opposite direction and just fully embraced that. And it was a mind blower for the actors when at the end they realized as they came back together, it's because they both engaged all of that trinity. And it made, uh, it made the ending that much more emotional for them and thus for the audience because they saw something that was incomplete that um, came together because of the Trinity. It was one of the core reasons that the actors said that they understood their character's journey. That's really beautiful, uh, Jeffrey. It's such a great example of how we can take the entire arc of an entire story and look at it through this character's transformation from an imbalance to toward balance. And of course, these three forces, the thinking forces, feeling forces, and willing forces are massive human archetypes that are referenced throughout many, many mythological and spiritual traditions uh, where you have three forces and it's in Hindu, it's in the Judaic tree of life, it's in uh, Christian Trinity, it, it's in, in the um, Nor Nordic uh, mythology, it's just in myths, myth and mythology all over the world and uh, throughout many eras. And so it's uh, no matter how you sort of identify it, we look at it through these three forces and we realize that they are always shifting in us. The balance is always shifting in us. And uh, it's really interesting to also then realize what kind of physical shifts they in, induce and also to extrapolate and put those then into the, the ground plan, into what we call the psychology of the stage and into the uh, processes for costuming, for design, and things like that. This, these tendencies, NMCA, the NMCA way takes these and, and uh, really expands on the details of them in terms of the sense of line of being straight, curved, or angular, and the sense of, uh, of the elements of uh, earth with the will force and water with the feeling force and air more in the thinking force and how these all can be represented or aligned with the characters so if you have a thinking dominated character you're and you had a light motif a melodic melodic line you might have tones that are higher pitched they might extend you know more um, more focused and, and longer lines, uh, whereas you might have a real sort of waltzy, uh, lyrical kind of um, middle tones, more middle tones for your feeling forces and more percussive and uh, drum and earthy tones for your characters that are more will driven. So when we create our designs, our sound designs, our lighting designs can reflect these, our set structures, curves, again, angles and straight lines, pinstripes, plaids, 
uh, floral patterns, all of these can be kept in mind to help uh, subconsciously deepen the transformations that that happen through the story. So I just want to throw in with that, that you might work with a designer who has no previous experience with the checkoff work, which I've certainly done many times, or sometimes even think, oh, you know, I don't consider that. Uh, but I think if you use terms, like I've used terms for a character, this character is very straight-laced, they're on the straight and narrow, they follow the rules, you know, I think they need to have stripes and something very tight-fitting and narrow, you know, they can get that description, or this character is just loving, and they're kind of all over the place, and they're a little squishy, and, you know, we have to have something that flows for them. And I've gotten great results from designers because they can relate to, you know, more of a personable description of a character, maybe instead of, oh, they're predominantly a thinking character, they're predominantly feeling, you know, that might be harder for them to grasp. But I think just us finding terms that we can then translate to a designer can really help with that. It's, uh, it's funny because once I re uh, learned this, I realized that all my casting, even when I was, an, I was an, uh, a social artistic director, and even as I directed shows, I was looking at these elements of thinking, feeling, willing, and how they did it. And it drew me to, to cast that person because those qualities, the way they were thinking, the way they were feeling, the way they were willing, fit the character that I saw when I read it. So, and then once I learned this, I'm like, oh, what, magical, of course. Well, I, I was using it my entire creative life until I, until I saw this. And it's great. I think you, last week you are talking about Meryl Streep. Uh, watch her in Sophie's Choice and then August in Osage County and look at the difference between her thinking, feeling, and willing life and you'll know what a gold mine this is. And Paul, I know, um, like Brad talking about one way to get people to very quickly identify the potentialities within Chekhov uh, through this TFW, that um, you've had a lot of success bringing it out in one-off workshops at SCTC or KCACTF, that sort of thing, am I correct? Yes. I, I love teaching this as a, uh, I think a student should receive it right away because how do they become the master, master puppeteer or the concept of a master puppeteer? What's the difference between, you know, the actors that are always themselves and on Meryl Streep? It's because they have a knowledge of this and they know that they can't just always be this one tone. There are different, everybody's different, right? I mean, if I'm always going to be my same pace, I'm very quick. I, I'm never going to be able to characters that are not like me. Right, so I want to be able to enter that sandbox and realize, oh wow, and start studying people, even in the, within the department. I have them say, "What is this colleague and what is that colleague?" They're like, "Oh wow, they're so different." I'm like, "Yeah, right." Do you want to be able to play them one day and this one day? Because the director who's watching you come in, they're going to see the character and they're going to see those qualities. So find them. Um, when we look at the the. The, that sense of um, radiating the archetype for the casting. Uh, we look at those big basic archetypes uh, of the hero, the villain, the victim, and the bystander, and we can identify a different thinking, feeling, willing pattern and tendencies very distinct in them. The will forces of your victim and your bystander are not the same as they are in your victim, uh, in your villain and your hero. Mm -hmm. And the intelligence levels and the emotional capacities. So uh, they're, they're all different. And if you find yourself continuously, if an artist were finding themselves continuously being cast as the exact same type, then one could suspect that you are radiating that particular predominance. Like my husband was very frequently cast as a bully. And whether that was a police officer or a truck driver or a redneck, um, it, they had varying intelligence capacities. You know, some of them were, were stupid rednecks and some were very shrewd, uh, dangerous, bullies, but they all had this high um, sense of physical authority. Uh, so that, that really is then in the will force. And if he wanted to change how he was being cast, if he didn't like that type, then he would have had to allow more people to see his more feeling side, um, 
his less will driven side, uh, you know, in some of the, his interactions with them. He would have consciously needed to walk into the room revealing that feeling self if he was going in for a feeling dominated part. So we would want to keep those things in mind. I find that students have no idea what they are. So when they even start thinking about this, they're like, oh my goodness, what a wonderful tool to use. I didn't even realize that I have no will. My will has been, I don't have it. I just don't have a will. You know, it's like Jenny and Forrest Gump. She has no will, right? She, they, they realize they're like, oh, I need to work on that. So we do the AGs too. I think it's really important for them to understand, do I have a will? Do, what is my thought life and what is my feeling life? A lot of people don't have a feeling life. That's kind of important to make the money moments, moments in LA or in New York. You gotta know how to get there. And um, I think they're really important to like, have that understanding of, oh, this is where I'm at and I kind of need to play around and find my unique feeling life, my unique feeling life, and then be able to play the Be the Master Puppeteer and change it. Um, Will, speaking of Will, um, I would like to ask you how you explain to a student what is Will? <laughs> How do you answer that question, Will? Uh, I think it's the urge. You talked about the urge. I think that's a great word. Urge or need to achieve something. So I talk to them about, you know, you're getting up to get to class. You know, sometimes you don't. You have no will. You, you miss class. You skip class. But what is it? What is that inside of you that gets you up early in the morning, because I usually teach one of the first classes in the department, and gets you here. You're willing yourself to do that, you know, and if not, and you don't feel the willpower, some of them just, uh, as Paul was saying, they don't have a lot of will. I think that's why they don't do so well, particularly their first semester, and then they start discovering it. So I might talk about it in that first class, they might not really understand it, but then as time goes on and now they force themselves and now maybe they're only sleeping four hours a night because they're so excited to do this and that, like they've discovered their will to achieve something uh, and, and then they realize what that is. So I think I just start out with a very basic of, you know, what is it that's getting you up and getting you to class? You know, that's your will force. So that's, that's how I would explain it to a student. But also, if you don't have the will to go uh, to class, it also can be a will-driven person because if you don't want to go, you have the plus and minus, like the qualities inside of those forces that give you uh, more complex things. Because a lot of the time students uh, come up to me and say, uh, how do I, um, you know, how, how can I do it without being a stereotype, without playing a stereotype um, or without being, um, you know, one dimensional. So you need to, to know the whole aspect of every force. Yeah, I was going to say that one of the things that I have found for me as an actor and also when I'm talking, when I'm side coaching and talking to students is that is that if they've made a choice, say, uh, say the, uh, um, I don't know, if they've made it, if a student or if I have made a choice that's oriented toward um, being a thinking character, for instance, or or being a, a a feeling character, that one of the best ways for me or for um, for me to tell to teach them about how to find something that's a that's a different quality of depth inside of the character is to explore explore that character not as a not with your first decision which is that he or she might be a thinking or feeling character but go somewhere else with it go go to thinking and see how this character what quality of this character is thinking or what quality of this character is willing um what things inside of the characterization that you're choosing are those things and how and how much does that end up sort of infiltrating and coming in and being a part of it. And, um, and I, I find that, that, that this, ex, this departure oriented exploration is actually a really good way to create depth inside of the characterization. It's actually a really tremendous way to find things that you didn't, especially if somebody's gotten into a rut or they just keep doing it the same way each time. It's a way to sort of force yourself to do it differently. And so, but but you're you're staying with the character, but you're but you're searching a different aspect 
of the character. And it's just very rich. It's just a very rich thing to choose to do. It, I imagine that it will bring a real uh, lovely multi-dimensionality to it. And any get like one of the things that um, uh, Yul Brenner did for over his 5,000 performances of The King and I Live um, was he, he picked a different tool every night. And the interesting thing about using thinking, feeling, willing uh, is that you could just shift the quality or shift the predominance if we think of it as a circle and we think of it as a as having three sections of this circle um, the uh, the the dividing lines morph and they shift and where you know where your thinking forces are dominant in uh, on tonight's performance can shift or the quality of your thoughts. So you can shift into the will force with a different quality than the last performance or the last rehearsal and shake it up. And uh, uh, along the lines of what you were saying, Brad, it's like, I feel like our talent magnetizes the interesting, you know, jeweled sparkling moments of that. And they stay layered in. Uh, so that you get this richness and breadth of perspective there. I, I, I wonder if we can do the palace, the palace exercise for the character with the thinking palace, maybe feeling palace and uh, willing palace. I don't I, know if it's not too complicated. I think that's fantastic. I think it's really important for us to come to an understanding of what the characters will is like and what their thinking force is like and what their feeling force is like and so over the course of development of the artist of course we need to know what our own is and the beauty of the palace exercise being able to step across a threshold into an unlimited dimension that has portals or um, matrix you know doors or dimensions you know rooms, call it however you'd like, um, this uh, being able to know what your own will is like, being able to then go in as the character and find out what their will is. And it's possible in the same way that Will was talking about re-languaging for your designers, uh, not necessarily using the check off terminology, but using the uh, uh, using the images associated with it, I think of the Palace of Desires, which was one that uh, that we've done. Um, how does that relate to uh, the Palace of Yearning, the Palace of Love? Uh, so you could take different aspects of it if somebody wasn't really um, able to understand this term, the will, for example, um, then you could find other things like, like the, the palace of, of wants or something like that, different realignments of it. I think it's important to note that, uh, especially with younger actors, that these are universal and not <clears throat> one is good, one is bad, or that one person being dominated by this doesn't make them particu particularly good or bad, but that these, that drive is, um, is where it is centered, where those forces are pushing their decisions. And so uh, as we think about that, I, I and I've talked to my students about this, they will often after we explore this say, I think I understand this teacher now a little bit more and what drives them. Or I think I understand my dad a little bit more. I think I understand so-and-so just a little bit more because it's not about it being a negative or a positive, it's just what drives us. Very good. Paul. I like what you taught when, when I first learned it and you're talking about the heel of the hands and the heel of the foot. And there's something about being a little kid. You, we all know what it is to be five years old. And I think you said, I want my mommy to press her heels down. I, or I want, I'm not moving from this spot. Boy, I tell you, I don't think a, a, one student has ever said, oh, I didn't feel that. You know, because I think we all revert back to that space where we just wanted something, right? So you, I think if you're trying to find that universal moment, 
I think you taught that in a class. I was like, wow, that's it's great. It's always worked for me. So that's kind of the first thing I do to have them get a hold of that. You you referenced um, uh, Jenny in in Forrest Gump, and of course Forrest Gump is a great model if anybody knows the movie uh, for seeing how you see how Forrest is thinking dominated and it's this kind of slow thought but you see when he gets on a train of thought he stays on that train and, and he runs like the wind and he runs in these straight lines and he does all his movements really in these linear patterns and he has this you know plodding uh, non non-expressive tones right and and he's very a, a really good example and then at the very end when he sees his son he gets this little tilt in his head and you just see this his feeling force is all just sort of rushing to the fore um, and you and you see Jenny who is just this always in water she's always a uh, a dish rag. She's always a mop. She's just had her will completely raped out of her, and she, in through the through the process of their union, um, she is able to uh, have her will galvanized. She's able to create something real in the world, uh, rather than attaching herself to a strong-willed male. And, and she could never attach herself to Forrest because she was so lacking in will and he was lacking in will that they couldn't actually go any further uh, with each other. Um, Forrest, Forrest's will is so weak that he only takes action when he's told, you know, run, Forrest, run. And so he responds and he engages his will when he's prompted to. And of course, then you have Sally Field, who is just a, all about the will force. And she's going to do use her will force to get Forrest in the school. She wants him in the school. And, you know, she's about the doing. She's all about, you know, stupid is as stupid does. And this, uh, this uh, Lieutenant Dan, uh, who's also a will force character who gets his will blown off and then becomes a feeling dominated character in the seas in the wheelchair everything's rolling and roiling and ultimately through the you know force of light the strike of god through really going into the torrent of his full emotional immersion he finds his thinking force, he finds his will force and he's able to get married to Susan who and now being balanced, finding his balance. They, they find their balance um, in, in the end. So it's another great story to help people see how these uh, elements can come, that can be understood. Don't forget about Bubba. Yes, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see Baba Baba is so feeling dominated. He even, I mean, the character, again, it's not that these actors knew this. They didn't necessarily know what they were doing. Maybe they, maybe they didn't, but, but nonetheless, as we've observed, this, Chekhov didn't make things up. He observed what works. And, and the actor who played Baba put those those things, in, you put stuff in his cheeks to round him out and you feel how round he is in the, sh the curve of the shrimp and all, he's so feeling force dominated. He really um, is, he gifts his feeling force, you know, to, to Forrest. Um, and that's, you know, one of the, uh, you know, it's just a, a super beautiful performance with uh, it in that um, in it, an ex interesting exercise to awaken the will is to have uh, is to do the blindfold radiation um, puppet exercise so it is standing socially distanced from your partner <laughs> good six feet, really even more, like a 10 feet away, 
and your partner has their eyes closed and you are gesturing to them like you're trying to pull them to the left or pull them to the right or lift them up or have them squat or move forward or move backward and you can really um, experience as the puppeteer who's trying to manipulate your puppet from a distance without speaking words <laughs> you can really feel through your whole being uh, how you know how your your body is trying to urge and radiate your urges to them and you can feel your emotional response rise and fall with the success and the failure and you can even start if you look back after you've done it you can actually start you can notice how your thoughts were operating in that process of like well i noticed that she tended to go up before she went down so so I, I'm just going to watch what she's doing and then I'm going to pretend that's what I wanted her to do it. And you start cheating, right? You start thinking how you can cheat so that you can win. And then you realize, wow, I'm using my thinking force in order to meet my will force's desire for victory. <laughs> so it's a really fun exercise and, um, I think it helps us really sort of understand how the will force lives. The, that word urge uh, we find very, very useful. Uh, and to understand that there are crippled wills, strangled wills, uh, and the story, of course, of the tortoise and the hare, the rabbit and the turtle uh, is our, a classic uh, um, fable and a fable being something that is a, a, a moral story using animals. Um, so it, there are different languages that use this similar story, but the animals are slightly different. But this story is again found in myths all over. The will force that is erratic, chaotic, scattered, and the will force that is slow and steady. Uh, as a, a teaching process for the will. I just really loved what you said when, you, when you're looking at the script, Lisa, about being able to, like, you just did the whole Forrest Gump explanation, right? But really looking at the script, both as, um, you know, dramaturg, as director, um, before you, designers, as Will had mentioned before, and really looking at that map, even before you put it onto the actors. And it just allows more clarity on where the script is naturally and organically telling you what to do. It, it's true. And if, especially in the dramaturg writer area, if your characters are not popping as distinct human beings or whatever they're I mean, they could be objects, they could be teacups, right? But the, if the character is, the characters are not distinct one from another. If you are not hearing what we might call the voice, the distinct voice of the character, then it's possible that you are writing your characters to your own psychological profile. So uh, if you're a thinking dominated character, it's possible. I mean, I had, I had a play where the, the writer was very clearly a thinking dominated character and he wrote what he was not, but he wrote it, his languaging patterns and everything else really were thinking dominated and it's not what he wanted for the character. Uh, he, he wanted a really feeling dominated character, but he wrote all her languaging, uh, you know, was a two person and both characters were through the thinking force, very clear in the languaging. And so, it, 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 you know, I, I absolutely played completely against the, um, what was, was the, what were the clear thinking dominated patterns so that I could contrast my, uh, you know, my partner.
it's really uh, helpful to know you that even if your script is not well written, that you can direct around it or act around it to make it stronger. But a great, all great playwrights, the, these distinctions between the characters will actually be there, just channeled. Paul. I had one question. Do you or anybody else on the panel here that, um, do you have any good ideas for beginning uh, feeling exercises? What do, what do people usually use to enter into that world? Because we talk, talk about the thinking life and the will life. Does anybody have anything other than just talking about, like you said, the dog or somebody that you really love and start using the palm of your hands and just tell us, you know, tell a story to the person about why you love someone? Yeah, um, I, I, it is, um, Uh, because uh, in the Chekhov work, we don't really use memory recall of personal experiences. Um, there, there are very few times that I will actually do that. But in the original initial expression of this, I do invite people to get engage in a discussion about a, fa a fantasy fulfilled. So talk to me about... Uh, you know, a great trip you'd like to do, some amazing, wonderful thing you'd love to do. Uh, what would it be? Or I do invite them to share about something they did that was super fun and fantastic. Um, so, so that they start to, they start to get excited and, uh, and start to recognize the, the patterns. In teaching this, I do like to induce the, uh, experience first and then have them reflect on and observe what they did so that they because this concept can you know I it, it's pretty common for me when we share it for someone to go like that like wow this is a game changer this discovery about thinking feeling and willing really can change the entire understanding of humanity for a person when it's brand new to them. And if I say, it is this, it is this, it is this, and when it's thinking we move straight lines, it's monotone, it's blah, blah, blah. If I tell them that, they're gonna turn around and say to me, well, how do you know that? Why is that true? Who taught you that? Who said that? I don't see that written in Michael Chekhov's work. Uh, where is that written? <clears throat> but if they have done a thinking dominated task like x plus x times y plus 2 divided by 58 um, and really engaged in a thinking dominated activity and then flown back over it and reflected and noticed and seen the patterns that were present they have evidence that this is not something made up it is an observed situation. And the, the movement, the flowing patterns, uh, I mean, it, it all, and, and the will force, you know, the, the basic tantrum of the child, uh, it's all so evident. And so to help people, uh, this, is, these, this trinity of psychology is one of the most important tools to have people do a POA on, a practice, observe, apply, home play. Because when they go out and you say, okay, I want you to come back to the next class and I want you to have identified three people who you believe were thinking dominated in a certain moment, maybe not their whole time, but, and I'd like you to demonstrate what made you think that, right? And next time, or, or I want this group over here, I want three of you to do thinking people, I want three of you to do feeling people, I want three of you to do will force people. And you guys come back and show me, you know, come back and sh do a little, you know, character study. Um, this, this actually kind of was part of our longer, our 10 day version. Um, back in Maine uh, of our course. Um, and so to, to have somebody actually literally begin to identify 
thinking, feeling, and willing people in their lives uh, is really one of the best ways to get them to understand this. And the other is in conversation to dialogue with somebody about their thoughts, about their feelings, and about their will so that people can experience in themselves the different relationships that they have, that their, that their feeling force has a different relationship to food than their thinking force or their will force. For example, you're sitting there looking at a menu. What, is your, what do you think? What are you thinking about? What are you feeling about what you're looking at? What do you buy? What don't you buy because there's, it's going to cost too much, right? And do you not buy that because you just don't think you should pay that much or because you're thinking you don't have enough money? Or do you buy it anyway, even though it's way overpriced because it's what you want now? Or do you really feel like having that, but you know that you have to fit into that costume and so you're not going to do it. You're not going to eat that, you know. Uh, what, when, I mean, so this idea of looking at a menu and trying to identify what you think, what you feel, and what you want, and what you're willing to order, right, is, and, and the same could be said about just deciding where to go or what to eat. You know, where, where do you want to go, honey? Oh, I don't care, wherever you want to go. How about we go to Chinese? Well, you know, we kind of had Chinese. Yeah, you know, this is what, what am I making my decision on? You know, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, if, I, if I say, honey, how about Chinese? Nah, nah. There is a will force that says, eh, don't want that. As opposed to, well, God, you know, that's a feeling there. And if the response is, how about Chinese? No, let's go Mexican. Right? That's another, that's coming. So just helping inspire our participants to really acknowledge that these forces exist. They sway us in our action, they, they affect our own vitality and living process. And, and indeed, the search for balance uh, of this is ultimately uh, what we achieve. We achieve balance when we're in the state of inspiration and, and our thinking, feeling, and willing forces are in perfect balance. That's where we're in a true um, inspired living. But that's not very dramatic, is it? <laughs> no, no. So perfect state of balance, really boring for the storyteller, but a brilliant place for the artist um, to strive to be and be empowered to jump off of, transform, and morph out of and back to. Just regarding, Paul, your question, mm -hmm. I uh, sometimes um, initiate feeling um, you can talk about the holiday that you want to do now, but or yeah, fantasize of, on, and you're talking in front of a um, of a fi of a fireplace, and you start to uh, you know warm your hands in front of it, and then you like go you know when this the, the pattern is starting to come, and these waves are starting to come. This is something that maybe can be helpful. I really love that, Ophir. Um, uh, I can really see how powerful that is. And it awakens just a topic that's come up for us and uh, for me and, and a couple of other uh, environments. And that's about the senses and uh, this you know, sense of smell and taste and touch uh, that, are, uh, that are very clearly uh, connected to this realm of the feeling forces. Um, but the, the idea of warmth as a sense 
and uh, Rudolf Steiner, who of course influenced Michael Chekhov very heavily, suggests that there are 12 senses, these, these basic five senses that we want to, well, that we're sort of born with fairly developed, fairly developed. We, we have a little developing of our eyes and our ears and, and things like that. Um, uh, but we really, uh, he identifies the sense of warmth as one of the primary senses. And the sense which affects us so quickly that we have the lowest tolerance for disagreeance with. So that is to say we can have a smell that we find disagreeable and tolerate it much more or a sight that is disagreeable uh, or a touch, an actual touch that's disagreeable, we will tolerate those sound much longer than we will tolerate um, uncomfortable temperatures. And that we translate that sense into uh, these psychological conditions, meaning we have, we have uh, emotional warmth and cold from people. And we have psychological warmth and cold. And we have will-based will warmth and cold, the, the actual physical process. So uh, our cold analytical intellect, we're trying to warm with our heart forces, for example. And, um, and our cold, hard will our earthbound will, we're trying to warm into, you know, being sensitive to the, the feeling forces. So uh, I, I love this um, sense of uh, warming at a fire and, and what is it, what parts of you do you warm, you know? And when you are warmed by somebody's presence, uh, when you are chilled by them and so these so it's also interesting to look at how the sense of warmth in the feeling realm uh, affects us and where we use it where we reference it where it appears in our um, uh, our languaging like oh that gave me a chill right and hey chill chill out uh, you know wow you look really hot today you do you actually look really hot today so um you know what happens when you hear that when you feel that it's like oh uh, kind of like a little response there so um she gave me the cold shoulder so it's uh, a, just a, an interesting aspect to the feeling force well ladies and gentlemen we're going to wrap this up thank you so much for joining us as you know will leaves uh, you know on the hour when when uh, he has another um, obligation so we're very excited that you're here and we will continue next week we're going to move on to radiating and receiving as the as an act of characterization bodies.
Ah!